Welcome everyone to an evening with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and novelist Connie Schultz in conversation with WOSU's interviewer extraordinaire Ann Fisher. I'm Linda Cass, owner and event curator at Gramercy Books. We are live streaming this program through Zoom webinar and it will be recorded. As you know, tonight we are featuring Connie's debut epic novel, The Daughters of Erie Town a powerful and sweeping story that begins in 1950s small town America and is about hidden desires, long held secrets and the sacrifices people make for family and for their dreams. Let me preview the next hour or so for you. After introductions, Connie and Anne will talk for about 40 minutes. That will be followed by about 20 minutes for your questions submitted in the Q&A box, which I'll explain in a moment. Since this may be your first experience on Zoom webinar, I'll share a few tips with you. First, you should close your browser and all applications on your device to produce the clearest screen image. The most important tool you have on your screen is the Q&A function. You'll find that icon on the bottom of your screen if using a desk or laptop or at the top of your screen on other devices. This is where Anne will be taking your questions for Connie during the latter portion of this program. You can write your questions into this box at any time during the program. Those questions, liked by many others, will be upvoted, which means they'll rise to the top of the Q&A box and will more likely be asked. Another tool is the chat box, which allows you to chat among yourselves, but it will not be monitored by the panelists. That icon also is at the bottom of your desk or laptop screen. Kicking, clicking this will open a column on the right side of your screen. We only hope your chats don't distract you from what will be an intriguing conversation tonight. I want to draw your attention for a moment to the chat box. We've placed a registration link for the next two Gramercy Books live streamed events. First on June 23rd at 7 p.m., our monthly book club will discuss the novel Afterlife by acclaimed author Julia Alvarez. It will be facilitated by former Columbus Dispatch arts editor Nancy Gilson, and Ms. Alvarez will join the second half of the program hosted on the Zoom meeting platform. <clears throat> the second link is for the July 9th conversation between two journalists, Robert Kolker and Jocelyn Linder. The discussion will focus on Kolker's book, Hidden Valley Road, the true story about a mid-century American family with six of their 12 children diagnosed with schizophrenia that became science's great hope in the quest to understand this disease. And the final link in your chat box is for anyone wishing to buy an additional copy of Connie's novel. For nearly two decades, Connie Schultz has charmed readers with her nationally syndicated column and her two critically acclaimed nonfiction books, Life Happens and And His Lovely Wife. Critics have celebrated her work, describing it as evocative, engaging, and intelligent and affecting. Now she has turned her eye to fiction, releasing her heartfelt debut, The Daughters of Erie Town, which was just released by Random House last Tuesday and immediately made the indie bestseller list. Connie is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and a professional in residence in the journalism school at Kent State University, her alma mater. She lives in Cleveland with her husband, Sherrod Brown, and their rescue dogs, Franklin and Walter. They have four children and seven grandchildren. Connie, Gramercy Books is so thrilled for you to join us tonight. Thank you so much, Linda. And in conversation with Connie will be Ann Fisher. Ann is the executive producer and host of All Sides with Ann Fisher on WOSU 89.7 NPR News. Ann joined the WOSU public media team in 2009 after nearly 30 years in the newspaper business where she covered politics, pub public affairs, culture, media, and business. A native of Michigan, Ann is a graduate of Michigan State University School of Journalism. Ann, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to recognize WOSU Public Media and Mills James Productions for being Gramercy Books community partners for this program. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Now, a warm welcome to Connie Schultz 
in conversation with Ann Fisher. Hello, Hi, Ann. Ann. <laughs> so good to see you. This is good to see you too. I wish we uh, were in person. Of course, everybody does, but um, there, uh, there's something about your book that from reading it just makes me feel that much closer. You really, it feels like you pour so much of yourself and your own personality into it. And I know that you worked on it for about 10 years. Right. And, uh, I'm wondering if it manifested the way you imagined it, the way you dreamed it um, 10 years ago. I guess I would have to say, which dream are we talking, right? Because over time it does turn into something else, but what it originally was intended to be, it has remained. Um, I just got there in very different ways than I had anticipated because I had never written a novel. Yeah. Like what's, um, one of the things is the foreshadowing of it. I think you do a really great job with that. And um, that seems to me like it must be a hard thing to do, to look ahead and, and take the reader someplace in the future. Well, I had the advantage of having done a number of serial narratives for um, newspapers for the Plain Dealer under the tutelage of Stuart Warner. He was a great editor for me. It still is a great editor, but he was the one who first taught me how to write narrative nonfiction, which takes the fiction writer's tools to tell a nonfiction story. And so foreshadowing, reconstructing, I'd had some experience with that. Now, the difference between doing <laughs> narrative journalism and doing fiction is when you reach those tensions, when you reach those moments and you're stumbling, you can't pick up the phone and interview anybody. You've got to figure out what your characters are going to do here, and it can be a bit more challenging. And, and I always emphasize this, that I am so lucky that this is what I get to do. So I understand it's not hard compared to particularly what the characters in the book did for a living, certainly what my parents did. But it was a challenge in a way that um, I love because I could feel myself growing as a writer as I was working on it. The idea of being a journalist, um, I'm, now I'm a journalist too. I mean, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. I, I'm famous for picking up the phone one more time and asking one more question. How yeah. did you, what did you do instead? Well, one of the, I finally remembered to bring my accordion notebook. The, it's a moleskin. And instead of having just page after page, it folds out into, so I can map it out, right? And one of the things that I would do is I would go back to this when I was having trouble with what a character would do next, because I understood I didn't know the character as well as I needed to. So I would lay this thing out on the table and look at it and figure out, so where, what am I missing that helps build the character of this person? that helps the backstory of this person so that I so that I can figure out what this person would do in that moment. And that's right. how I did it. <laughs> um, and did you did you have uh, uh, what do you call it writer's block? I'm a columnist, so I, I've never been afforded the luxury right. of writer's block. I always tell the, the best definition I ever heard of being a columnist is you sit under the windmill and you get hit in the head and you think, oh, I'm glad that's over and it just keeps coming and coming because you have all these deadlines. So I'm accustomed to having to produce, right? I, and so I'm fortunate, I suppose, in that way. I've often thought that writer's block really is a matter of not being disciplined enough, at least for me. I have to sit in that chair. I have to find ways to make myself produce. It has really helped me to have a schedule for writing. I, I often say this, that I'm not a morning person in that I don't wake up like Sherrod, for starters. He's you know immediately happy, immediately full of talk, but I do wake up and I can work early in the morning. And so I have my coffee, I have a little breakfast, I go sit in my sunroom and I light a tea light often, which lasts between three or four hours. And as long as it's burning, I try to be producing. And my dear friend, um, the very talented novelist, Rudy Umregar, gave me great advice about three and a half years ago when I was starting to really struggle. And she said, just write a thousand words a day. If you write a thousand words a day, you're gonna get to where you wanna go. As you know, and as any writer knows, that those thousand words each day, many of them are not going to survive, but they get you to where you need to go, and they do get you to the story. And I have found that is just as true of fiction as it is writing long nonfiction. Right. Sometimes, if you can pull out one wonderful paragraph out of that thousand words, that's what it was all yeah. about, right? That, that is what it was all about. And the thing is, it gets in your head then that you know what you're doing. I mean, the worst thing you can do is keep resisting sitting down and working because that's where the um, lack of confidence can take over and the insecurities can take over 
Um, I'm always going to be an insecure writer. I don't know a writer who isn't. But there, there came a moment when I started to feel that I, I knew this story and I knew the people in it. And I owed it to them now to, to tell their stories because I, they've been spending so much time with me in my head. It was time to unleash them. And, you know, I obviously they always tell us, you know, writers learn early on to write about what you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm wondering, how do you do that? and write about this world that you occupied is it not not this literal world but right um, you know the eerie town is is reminiscent of ashtabula where you grew up or out the, the area around there and I'm just wondering how you push beyond the what you know to that next i guess i want to say beyond the veil but that's the wrong that's the wrong kind of reference but no, I, you know, I, I get what you're going for though um, <laughs> may sarton um the late poet who also wrote a number published a number of journals and i read all of them quite a few years ago said at one point she wrote at one point and i'm paraphrasing here but only in fiction perhaps can we be totally honest and i have said then if that's the case then this is the truest story i've ever told um because certainly it's not coincidental that i'm a, i have i come from the working class in a small working class town in lake on the shore of lake erie and Erie Town is a working class town on the shore of Lake Erie, right? I mean, it, I drew on what I knew in terms of, uh, people have often asked me, are those people, any of those people from your life? No, but, but the hearts and souls of some of them have seeped into my consciousness in a way that they're, I hope are represented fairly in the book. I don't think the, the working class should be romanticized, but I also don't think the working class should just be demonized or used as props. I and mean, one of the reasons I wrote this book was, my my editor at Random House, Kate Medina, said to me, you know, in 2007, right before my second book came out, she said the working class is really underrepresented in modern literature, and we think you could do something about that. I couldn't disagree with her about the first part. I mean, growing up in the working class, there's a reason I include a quote from a Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith, because it was the first time I read a book that had rem remotely the same kind of characters that were populating my own life. And so I knew that I wanted to write this book in part because, well, two things. I love women's stories. There are a lot of, there's a lot about women and their stories in this book. And I've, oh, much of my career has been committed to that. I also have written about racism all of my career. And that is certainly an element of this book. You can't write about the white working class, particularly in the 60s and 50s, 60s and 70s and not address that or even now. But I also wanted to make clear that our roots are our beginnings, they're not our excuses. And you can come from that and still loathe the racism that you see in some households. The other thing I wanted to make clear is the working class isn't just white. It never was, and it isn't now. Um, where I grew up in Ashtabula, a lot of people don't know this about that small town, but half of my elementary classes every year were um, black students. And so when you grow up knowing your friends don't have to look like you to be like you, in so many ways, in the important ways, it informs your work. Uh, it certainly did mine. And the two main professions represented in the book, uh, Rick is a utility worker, just like my dad. Uh, Ellie is a nurse's aide, just like my mom was. Um, I chose those professions in part because they're the working class professions I knew best. You know, speaking of your mom, there is a story, but there's a list of duties that Ellie um, creates because she wants to validate her choice and the fact that she wants to continue working to Brit. She wants to validate that to him, make him appreciate what she does as a nurse's aide. And um, there's a story behind that. Yeah, there sure is. And I touched upon it in my column last week, which is the only time I'll write about my novel, but it, it matters to me in this way. We did not discover that it was a number of pages. The, the list that appears in the novel is a much shorter list. Uh, my mom had made um, a very long list of what she knew to be her nurse's aid duties and made copies at least for all in the family. There were that many, but none of us saw them until after she had died. And it has haunted me that I don't know why she made that list and that I never had a chance to talk to her in greater length about what she did in her job. And so when it came, it really, all of a sudden, I was writing about Ellie and her frustration with Breck, and they had had a particular conversation, and I thought, I know what I'll have her do. I'm going to have her go by herself into a restaurant, which she's never done before, and she's going to make that list. And so in that way, at least, mom has finally had a chance 
to tell others some about, at least a little bit about what she did for a living, 20 years, almost 21 years after her death. You know, we can't do any spoilers because uh, a lot of people yeah. haven't finished the book and I, I don't want to, right. but how Ellie blossoms, um, for lack of a better word, I suppose, through the novel is very, it's very gratifying. It feels grounded and real um, and not, not fantasy. Uh, it's, it's happy to me. I'm so glad to hear that because Ellie, as you know, has so many struggles in this novel. But, and she has a daughter who is determined to some extent to pull her along because her daughter, of course, is born in the 50s and comes of age in the 70s, in the height of the, that wave of the feminist movement. And I don't, it, it, but I will say Kate Medina was really smart in the editing. When, um, first of all, my novel was way too long. I turned in 197,000 words and why didn't I ever stop to ask anybody, how long is a novel typically? I mean, I've been reading them all my life, but I never, and I, one of the first things she said, well, you know, they're usually about 110,000 words. I just about passed out, but we got there. It's about 122,000 words. But she really, uh, she had such good advice. And one of them was this, she said, you know, do you want her to be pathetic? Do you want her to just, people to just be sick of her whining and how she never stands up for herself? Or do you want her to grow more than this? And as soon as she said that, I mean, I was mortified. No, I didn't want anyone to see Ellie that way, but it was clear that that's what I had done to some extent. And so in the revision, the, the big second draft, you know, that which is when you do most of the, the big work on a novel after you've written it, um, I, I wanted to add a lot more nuance to who she was, and I wanted readers to understand a lot more about what was going on within her. Another piece of advice that Kate gave me that was just so helpful is she had me count the number of pages where each character appears so that I understood where the lack of balance was. If you've got three primary characters, they should take up three, you know, three primary chunks of the book. And Brick was initially the most realized character, Brick McGinty. And I think part of that is because, well, obviously I'm not a man, and I was nervous about writing about a man in his internal world. And so I spent more time on him in the beginning, born of my insecurity and, and concern that I wouldn't get it right. It's been so gratifying to hear from some male readers, including friends who, well, first of all, I'm a little surprised when they say, thank you for not making all the men just bad guys. Well, why would I do that? Um, you know, I, I like, obviously I hate to say, I mean, must I say it? There are plenty of men I like, um, and I, and, and most people are bigger and better than their worst mistake. And I would say that's one of the other themes of this book, because it to me is true about most of us in life. I just want to remind our audience, uh, to check out the Q and A, uh, box. And if you have a question for, uh, Connie Schultz, um, I will get to it. They'll be rated on how many people, you know, click on it and say they like your question. So uh, brace yourself for that judgment. Um, uh, yeah, the Brick, Brick, again, I mean, it's probably the same sort of observation I have about him as he's a very full character. When you were mentioning how um, your editor told you to kind of count the pages devoted to each of the main characters, it reminded yes. me of, in politics how you have to count your quotes to make sure you're not giving one more quote right. to uh, a candidate or their campaign or anything than another. And uh, so that right. probably made a lot of sense to you uh, when that was proffered, but I might not have thought about it before you said it. I sure didn't think about it until Kate said it to me. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, there is a, a, a part of the book, and it's at the very beginning, it's at the opening, where you talk about, and it comes up, this item comes up later in the book, but it's the blue leather travel case. The train case. The train case. That yeah, everybody yeah, wanted one, and you know, I never was able to get one, and you were, you know, <laughs> uh, and is, is it real? Is it oh, it real? is real. Okay. It is a real thing. I'm trying to, I should have brought, I, I don't want to leave the screen here, but you it's have your over props now. nearby. <laughs> I, I have props, but I didn't put it, put it close enough. What I ended up doing is I knew, once I knew that the train case was going to matter more than once, that it was going to become something that was symbolic in the book, I decided I had to have one. And I had to have one from the 1950s. And I think I mistakenly said in one interview, I found it on eBay. I actually went back to my emails and, and realized I found it on Etsy. And uh, it was from the 1950s. I needed to be able to hold it, feel it. I needed to see the inside of it. I needed to feel the weight of it. Um, and so uh, I bought one. 
and it was on my desk or right next to my desk for months because it served as a reminder and also after a while it felt like an encouraging thing you know remember to bring it in make it matter when you do don't make it just a prop right make it significant and in the end i i got kind of attached to it it sounds so funny but what it was great is i posted recently about this train case i did a piece on i think it was all platforms twitter um instagram and facebook and i couldn't get over the number of mostly women who were sharing pictures of their mother's train cases or theirs or their grandmothers i had women in their 80s show me the train cases that they've had for decades. And all these stories came out. They remember how their grandmother's train cases smelled, or they remembered what was in them, their mothers, or they remember taking them when they first went to college and what a big deal it was. And so it's been so rewarding to, to hear from readers too, as they're, now we're starting to hear from our readers who've actually read the book, um, and the things that they remember or the things from the times that they hadn't hadn't even thought about and how they may have informed their own lives over time like our our bodies ourselves the you know the iconic book that uh, i actually used i had one i had the original from the 70s but my mother did not buy it for me let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> but i did have it <laughs> and it's <been> handy <laughs> yeah she in in what to pack in the blue leather travel case for college and your mother said the mother i say your mother but ellie's mother yeah, ellie told Sam, pack the must-haves. Right, the idea being, I mean, without giving too much away, Ellie had had dreams for her own, that train case was, was Ellie's originally, and it was virtually brand new. It ended up being unused. And she had always understood it to be the things you can't be without as a safe, you, don't, you can't find your suitcase or the things but it also represents what I think happens, and certainly from my own experience and from some of my students now at Kent State who are the first in their families to go to college. Your parents want you to go. That's what we know. We grow up knowing we are going to go to college, but so often um, the parents don't really know how to get them there or what advice to give them. And I wanted to show how Ellie in her own way, even as she could envy her daughter's chances, really wanted her daughter to succeed. Right. There is, uh, Samantha is very uh, intelligent, she's very bright. She gets a full ride scholarship to Smith and uh, anyone's dream come true, especially, you know, just any anyone's and Brick makes her turn it down. That right. nothing's free, he tells her. And that just, wow, he well, said we'll goes do it house but we'll pay it the honest way we aren't you know nothing's free. right but that goes right to what i was talking about that when you have working class values which are very fine values many of them you just don't trust anybody who's going to offer you anything for free and that includes college for your daughter and he's very proud that she went when she went behind his back and applies for financial aid he is so proud that with his union job she didn't qualify for it and Even i remember that quite well. used it <laughs> <laughs> the um ride in the car to college I, you know i to me there was in the in the opening the forward or the beginning of the story there's just a world in that theme mm -hmm. in the car driving to college for me i could have probably spent the entire time just on that just sort of mm -hmm. um grabbing the threads of that um I don't know, you just seem to pull together a whole world. Was that, did you start the book when you started writing it? Did it start with that in the original? Yeah? Not, not even remotely. Um, it started, well, the only thing I'll say so that those who've read it will know what I mean, but it won't spoil anybody. It started originally with the knock at the door. And then my editor said, you're giving away too much in the beginning. And okay. what I ended up doing, and she, I think at some point Kate even said, have you thought at all about maybe a drive to college? Because I had that in there. I didn't really, really write the preface, the prologue, I guess it is, until the book was almost done. And then I went back because I thought, well, what do we want to foreshadow here? We want to foreshadow that there's a family secret. We want to foreshadow the tension that this daughter is going to get to go to college to be the first in her family the tension between the parents for reasons we don't quite comprehend yet right and i wanted to and she's got her little brother there in the back seat with her and she's leaving him so it's a jumble of emotions for everyone and i wanted to be able to show that to give a glimpse into there is so much going on and now let's take you back to the beginning let's go back to first the 1940s 
um, when yeah. Ellie is not going to be raised by her parents and her grandparents to agree to, to raise her. So let's start there after we first show her daughter um, almost 30 years later in a car headed for college. Yeah, it, that makes sense then when you tell me that because it felt like these characters were fully formed. They were mm -hmm. fully three-dimensional. And yeah, um, that means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. That's high praise. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Of course, you know, having dreams about the future is a recurring theme. And that's sort of what I, what I kind of felt like the must haves were for the blue train case kind of a thing is pack your dreams. That that's right. kind of what I was thinking of, but dreams. And, you know, it's funny when I picked up, um, I, I was just looking at the book again uh, today, and I went to the very last page, which was turned out to be an, the acknowledgement, acknowledgements or whatever. And um, the very last thing you say at that point is, I mean it every time I say this year, you are my dream come true. And all I saw was my dream come true. And I'm like, did she actually end the story with that line? And I had to go back and tell, obviously it wasn't, it was in the acknowledgements, but dreams are important. They're they yeah. propel us in ways we don't even know. Well, they do. And um, to step out of the story for a moment, I hope that there are, that there, I know there are writers who are watching because there are always writers who are uh, involved in these book talks. And I hope that you can, if you feel like you've been stumbling or you haven't gotten there yet, I just want to remind you that I am 62 coming out with my first novel. And I have often said this, I did a TEDx talk three or four years ago um, saying that, our generation of women, my generation, I'm a boomer, we're the first generation of women who don't think we, didn't think we had to become invisible after we turned 50, and that we had lots of life to live yet. And the only regret I was going to have, which is how I ended up finishing, the, the bulk of the hard writing was in the last four years of it. And it was because I started to think about, including after my TEDx talk, my only regret about this novel was gonna be my not finishing it. I needed to give it my, my biggest biggest and boldest effort that I could. And I tell my students all the time, if you're never scared, you've stopped growing. And so I must be having a growth skirt, growth, excuse me, a growth skirt because I'm pretty much terrified right now. <laughs> but I think it's so important. And it's not lost on me that at 62, I'm the age my mother was when she died. And so I am really grateful for this opportunity to try this. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am to be on IndieBound's list already. It, it, it was really terrific news today. It is fantastic. You know, there's probably a lot of people out there right now that think, Connie Schultz terrified? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, look, if I don't try new things, I mean, this is not, if someone, I love the headline in the dispatch, she's trying her hand at fiction <laughs> writing. That, well, may the hand be steady. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is not a career pivot. This is a career leap you know, into the unknown, but it's been so gratifying so far to start hearing from readers and to, and the early, um, when we had the advanced reader copies, giving it to some friends and to family members, because um, that was the first any of them had seen it, except for Sherrod, who's read it, yeah, there it is, the art, as we call it, <laughs> um, and then it changed colors, the cover did, which I'm, I'm so thrilled, and the design is just wonderful, yeah. but yeah, I mean, of course I get nervous. I, my students often ask you, when did you stop getting nervous when you had to call somebody for an interview? And I said, I still get nervous sometimes. Yeah. I'm the last person they want to hear from on some stories. And I understand that. You know, I think you do it anyway. That's the key. It's, I would never want to give the impression that nothing rattles me. What I hope comes across is that it rattles me. And then I go ahead and do it anyway, because that's how you grow, right? Yes, that's how you grow. Um, Sam and Riley have a talk. Sam and Riley, Sam being the kind of the main character at a certain point in the story, and then Riley, her little brother. Now they're grown-ups, and they have a talk about the definition of working class as adults. And Sam, Samantha says that the first time she even thought about it was when she went to Kent State and she met so many other students that never knew anybody that went to the Vietnam War. And I, that felt like you. That was my direct experience. That, that happened to me. And when I was on the Kent State campus, one of the first books I read that wasn't being assigned to me was Michael Hare's Dispatches. I, I'll never forget standing in a bookstore, um, the Kent State bookstore, 
and seeing this book and I started reading it and it sounded like the little snippets and pieces of stories we had heard and I had had the chance to hear from some who had served. Many of them wouldn't talk at all. I mean, my home county of Ashtabula County lost 26 boys in that war. And um, it was, as it, and, and Sam said, at one point it seemed like every third house somebody was serving and that was definitely our experience. It felt like so many were and so many came back different. And until I went to Kent State, I didn't know that everyone didn't know people who served. And it was when I first became aware of class and that of course our town would have so many who went because we were a working class town. And if we had uh, you know, rural boys and small town boys, um, black and Puerto Rican boys as well as white boys and they were all going because college deferments were very rare where I came from. Did you, when, you, when I think about the Vietnam War and the impact, it kind of predated us because we started school about college about the same time. I think we're about the same mm -hmm. age. And when I got to college, it was like, oh, I missed all the good stuff, you know, all the, the you know, the demonstrations and that kind of a thing and thought I kind of missed out on it. And it did, it did feel sort of like a vacuum. Um, it was very different than what I expected when I went. I went to a Big Ten university, you know, state, state school and that kind of a thing like you. And um, I'm just wondering what else was going on at school at the time that helped you help Sam grow through that? Well, first of all, I went to Kent State, as does Sam, and that was where the May 4th shootings had happened in 1970, and I started in the fall of 75. And back then, I mean, I would never have gone back to teach at my alma mater if they hadn't owned their history and acknowledged it, and they do now in such magnificent ways in terms of acknowledging history and the lessons we can learn from that. But also don't forget, I was there in, as a you during, it was Gloria Steinem, it was a feminist movement. It was the women's room, right? It was, um, there was so much going on and here I was a small town girl. I was terrified when I went to Kent State because the population of the university was the population of my hometown, 26,000. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God. And I was fairly popular. You know, I'd done a lot of things in high school. I was an absolute nobody on the Kent State campus until I started working for the Daily Kent Stater where I found my home. And yeah. I've always said that the, the journalism program at Kent launched me, it really did. And it, and it helped me grow up, but it also helped me find my voice slowly, steadily. Um, I knew back then that eventually I would wanna be a columnist someday. And I, you know, I did a lot of reporting over the years and I didn't get to be a columnist for a long time. I always remember the editor who finally hired me as a columnist told me three years before he did that I didn't have it in me to be a columnist. Um, so I am used to the no, as so many women are, and I just had to power through those over and over again. That's interesting that you knew you wanted to be a columnist. I didn't really know I wanted to be a columnist until I was one kind of a thing. And then I, I loved it deeply. How did you know? What, what, was there a, a columnist that you read and, and that you wanted to, there weren't a lot yeah, of mo columnists. I was mostly reading men. That was one yeah. of the reasons I wanted to be a columnist. I thought, why are we hearing only from men? Um, mm -hmm. My dad, I'll never forget <laughs> I became a columnist when I was 45, and I called my dad. My mom was already gone. I said, Dad, I'm going to be a columnist. And he said, finally, you're going to get paid for what you've been throwing around for free for 45 years. <laughs> so to people who love and know me well, I mean, you're a surprise, right, that I'm <laughs> finally excited to have an opportunity to express my opinion. Um, and I've loved, I've been a columnist now for 18 years, and I really do, it's the perfect job for me. I had just come off a really big series about, Michael Green, a black man who had gone to prison for 13 years for a rape he didn't commit. And the real rapist turned himself in after the series ran, which was just an astonishing thing for us. And, but I, I was really starting to feel the restlessness of if I don't get to start having opinions about these things that I'm covering and doing deep dives in, I just don't know where I continue to grow as a journalist. For me, I was just itching to do that. And I had already been doing a lot of essays. Um, for other publications, for the Sunday Magazine, long before I got hired by the Blank Dealer. And uh, so in some ways, it was a natural transition for me. Is it very different not being associated with the Blank Dealer, with a, with a newspaper, what, not having a home, so to speak, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. It, in fact, um, I wasn't sure how it was going to go when I left in 2011. I just thought it was time for me to go. And I'm glad I did when I did, considering everything that's happened at the paper since. But I wasn't sure how it was gonna go because I, was, I didn't have an institution behind me. I am so grateful 
to all the papers who have picked me up. Um, the Illyria Chronicle picked me up, I think, the day after I resigned from the um, Plain Dealer as a show of support. And um, social media has really changed who you can reach with your writing. And I'm so grateful, particularly to the, I know there are some on this um, tonight who are from my Facebook community. And I am so grateful to all of the people there who have helped me build a community for discussion every single day. I mean, I don't think there's a day I haven't weighed in. Occasionally I've traveled and had to do it sparsely, but we weigh in on the issues of the day pretty much every day of the week. And we've really built a community of trust there. And they let me know when someone comes in and trolls. They let me, you know, and I do have fun with that occasionally. If somebody's really awful, I just let them know, <laughs> my goodness, we hardly knew you. And, and I'm so grateful for that because you are gone. <laughs> I'm glad. So, um, but you have to be that way if you're going to create a community where people feel safe to participate. Yeah, I'm always impressed <clears throat> the way you're just great on social media. And, and I think <clears throat> it's probably more of a challenge for me because I can't say what I think about everything. You know? Oh, I think if I were to call on this, it would have been such a different thing to try to do, right? I'm allowed to give my opinion. They should be reported. They should be informed. But I'm allowed to weigh in on the issues. And I've, had, I've heard from so many reporters who want to talk to me about that because their bosses are saying you got to get on more, but they don't feel they have the, the leeway. And they don't have the leeway. Twitter, exactly. I'm definitely a little harder hitting on Twitter at times, but we're often talking, we're talking to people in policy and fellow journalists. It's a different world there. Uh, on Facebook, it's really about community. Um, the, as, as far as the change and the transition <clears throat> from being a syndicated, to, to being a syndicated columnist without, mm -hmm. without a home, um, that's one thing. When you <clears throat> went to school to be a journalist, what did your folks think about that? Did that seem sort of, uh, bougie to that? I mean, they might not use that word, but really, you know, shouldn't you be a nurse or a teacher or a this or a that? Well, my mother really wanted me to consider nursing, but I just didn't have it in me. She had always wanted to be a nurse. And my sister Leslie became a nurse. My sister Tony became a teacher. Um, I, it never occurred to me that I could write for a living until my high school guidance counselor, Mr. Petro, looked at me. Because I said, well, I, think, I guess I'll go into social work. Because he said, what are you going to major in when you go to college? And I said, I am going to be a social worker, thinking I got to help people like mom wants me to, but I can't do the blood needle stuff. And he looked at me and said, yeah. I know you pretty well, and I think you're going to burn out pretty quickly because you just invest so much emotionally, but your writing scores are great. Have you ever thought about going into journalism? And I look so perplexed, I'm sure, because he said to me, Connie, you're going to be working for a long time. You should love what you do. And I'd never heard that in my home because my parents had jobs to make our lives possible. They weren't, my, as my dad would often say when I try to get him to tell me more about his job at the Cleveland Electric Illuminating, he said, it's a job, Connie, it's not a career. So when I became a journalist, what thrilled my dad the most was seeing my name in print. And I, but I didn't know nearly that until after he died. And I went into the Crow's Nest once where he used to sit all the time, his favorite bar. And they started telling me stories about how much my dad had talked about my writing career. He kept that to himself. My mother bought 10 copies of everything. I worked for the Sunday Magazine a lot. Ten copies. She had stacks everywhere. She looked like a, she was an early hoarder. <laughs> it was all Connie, Connie, Connie. So. <laughs> so what do you think they'd think of the book? I don't know. I think my mom. I don't know. I, I wouldn't have written this if they were still alive. Because it's too deep a dive into what it means to be us. People like us. And I think I needed to wait on this in that way. But of course, by the time it was suggested I should write it, both my parents had already died. They died in their 60s. Yeah. So I don't know. I think my mom would love to, you know, I, I, I've told this story before because it really matters to me. When my mom was dying, I was taking her to one of her appointments, and I think it was only about a month before she died. And I just was feeling pretty emotional because I would drive her over. And I said, Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm so... I've always had all these opinions. I never keep any of myself. I've been so mouthy. And she grabbed my hand and she said, honey, you're who I want it to be. And I think when I look back now, that's where Ellie begins with me. So who would, who would Janie have been if she could have been Ellie? Now, there's some, some things that happened to Ellie that definitely happened to my mom, but then Ellie's life becomes her own life. And Ellie finds her courage in different ways, right, and, and confidence in her own ways. And I think part of what I was doing was trying to reimagine that world 
from my mother, which really didn't occur to me until this very moment. <laughs> well done, Anne. Now I'm something <laughs> to be interviewed by somebody, this <laughs> professional, who actually read the book. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Crazy me. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, the, one of the blurbs, one of the review blurbs I read about the book, you know, the little flyer that comes with it, everybody, we always get these little flyer things that come with books and they, oh, there's, even blur seen that. Yeah. Yeah, there's blurbs in it. <laughs> and one of them said that it's, a, you know, the stories and the secrets and the, the, the saga and the, the generations and how some children make the same mistakes and how others fix the mistakes in the future. There's a lot of a lot of all of that. No one's perfect and um, far from it. And, and yet that's what makes them so wonderful in their own way. Um, well, so. thank you. I mean, I, I hope it mirrors each of us. None of us is perfect, right? Right. Um, and we're better than our worst mistakes. And that certainly is one of the themes, I hope, of the book. It definitely comes through. I am going to turn, we've got a ton of questions from the audience. Oh, and, great. Um, so I'm gonna like exit the uh, us thing um, now and turn to those um, if I can. Okay. And uh, I'll start with the ones that are at the top with the most thumbs up um, and uh, hopefully get through as many, many as we can for this um, fantastic audience. I know they're out there um, eager, to, eager to hear what you have to say. And, uh, um, and before we move on to that, I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for you know, sharing all this time with me and uh, talking like we have, I've really enjoyed it. You were my first pick, as you know, for the interview at Gramercy, and I got you, so thank you very much. And everybody who's listening knows why I picked you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, number one, uh, you mentioned on your Facebook page today that you're beginning to work on your next novel. Can we anticipate hearing more about the characters we've gotten to know and love in Erie Town? Um, I don't rule out a sequel to this book, but it will probably not be the next novel. I've already pretty, I mapped out quite a bit of the next novel. I need some time. I also want to see and hear from readers over the next year, um, just because it gives me more ideas about it. But I definitely have some thoughts, particularly for um, Ellie and Sam. Okay. Uh, well, here's one from Barb Seckler. She says, what is it like for Sherrod Brown to be married to Connie Schultz? And I think that's a play on everyone who always asks, what's it like to be married to Sherrod Brown? Well, Which I've been like asked a lot on this, on this book, <laughs> this virtual book tour so far. Um, that is so funny. I know he's watching right now. Um, I know it's probably killing him in this moment that he can't answer. So I, <laughs> so honey, I will say what you always say. I can't, you know, Sherrod never speaks for me and I can't speak for Sherrod. I will say this, he's read the book four times in various forms. I, there's no one who's been more supportive of this endeavor than my husband. And I've also said this a few times already, if anybody had told me in my 20s, 30s, or even very early 40s that I would ever have a husband like Sherrod, I would say they had a ba bad idea for a really unbelievable, completely non-credible novel. So I am living the life I couldn't imagine. Oh, let's see, uh, from Angela asks, did the period when you were a single mom influence this novel? And if so, in what ways? Fellow single mom here, I'm still waiting for my copy in the mail, so you may directly address this subject in the book. Being a single mom has informed so much of who I am to this very minute. I was a single mom for a decade. And one of the things I often do around Mother's Day is put out a picture out on social media with uh, my son, Andy, and my daughter, Kate, and me. And I just say, um, dear single mothers, I remember. I think that it's impossible for it not to have informed my book in ways that I may not even fully comprehend because I, I can't identify with any of the characters in terms of what it meant to be a single mother. I am starting to think about that as I approach the next novel. Because um, I was just thinking about what haven't I mind of my own experience that perhaps I could bring to the page. And I certainly remember those years. I used to describe myself as a ghost in my own house in the middle of the night, sometimes walking around, just scared to death I wasn't going to be able to pay the bills or that I wasn't going to be able to be everything my daughter needed because I was pretty much it much of the time. And I had such a network of friends who helped make it possible. So uh, it is so much a part of who I am that it's hard for me to distinguish it. 
when I write because it's changed my sensibilities about so much, including certainly childcare and how I feel about women, women's roles. I mean, I, I was on Winslow Road, the Winslow Road of Celeste Ng's book, right? Um, Little Fires Everywhere. Oh, I lived yeah. in one of those two family homes with my daughter. And somebody just asked me about that yesterday. And I said, you know, occasionally I still drive by, past that house, that first house of ours uh, when we were on our own because my son was grown and shake her. I think part because it, it, it became quite a time. It was, it was when my freedom came about because we were the ones who had to leave. And I, and I was not sure how it was going to go. And I just love knowing that it ended up turning out okay. I'm yeah, very nice sentimental. That story. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is nice to know the end of that story. That story is nice. Um, from Anne Kraybacher. I loved the character development throughout the novel. How did you select the names of the major characters? Thank you. Um, those had to come, uh, Brick I knew pretty early because I could imagine the build of this, this kid growing into a kind of a burly guy and I thought if I gave him red hair, my dad had red hair, so I was used to strong men having red hair, right? So I thought, um, I, I could see Brick being a nickname for him but because it, it also personified what he tried to present about himself in the world even though he was much more than that. Um, I don't really remember how I came up with the other names. I'm playing with names now. I will tell you, many other characters in the book. I actually had the yearbooks from my parents, thanks to Andover Public Library, because I couldn't find my parents' yearbooks for a while, um, from their classes, because Clayton Valley, Clayton named for my oldest grandchild, Clayton, at the time he was my only grandchild, now we have seven. Um, I wanted names that were common in that era. So some of the names you see in the 40s, 50s, and 60s are coming from those yearbooks. And then I used yearbooks, my yearbooks, and other yearbooks to make sure I was coming up with names that were pretty common uh, when we were growing up. And that's, uh, you know, names are funny things. They just come to you. For a while, I think Ellie had the name Lily. And then I hmm. decided that I liked Ellie better. Um, Rosemary um, Russo is a maiden, the family name of a dear friend uh, from long ago. You just, they come up from all over the place. McGinty, I knew I wanted them to be Irish because of course that's part of my experience as well. And um, you never know by the Schultz, but all on my mother's side. And I look more <laughs> Irish than my siblings. Um, so you just, you, you play with them. I'm looking at different names now. I, was, I asked my sister the other day, my sister, Tony, what are some of your favorite names? And she's just crazy enough to actually give me a list. So I'm looking at those right now. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, talking about how you figured names and, and, and picked them and made me um, think of something else I wanted to ask you, which is, uh, I wondered if you just sort of made a list of things from that era, because the, some of the things you put in the um, train case, uh, the legs stockings, the, egg, the legs eggs thing that, of course, you know, has contributed to this massive uh, pollution, plastic pollution. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we always said, no, I'll do something with these, and we saved them for a right. while, but did yeah. you just sort of never make, did. pardon me? And then we never did. Anything. No, we never did. Of course not. Yeah. But, it is, um, but did you make lists of things that from that time um, to... I, I did, but here's how I did it. Kate Medina, I didn't have enough of those kind of references at first. And um, Kate, my editor, suggested that if I would insert more of them, it would be helpful to readers to help them give a sense of time and place. Yeah. And so, you know, those little booklets you'll find in greeting card stands. I don't know if they even exist anymore. Oh, yeah. And the year you were born. I had yeah. them from like 1952 through 1996. I found them <laughs> on Etsy, eBay. I found some on Amazon because, it, and then it would trigger memories because we think we would remember so much, but, and the copy of it was wonderful. She would weigh in. Actually, that song didn't come out until later that year. It came out in yeah. this month or that movie. It, you're trying so hard to be careful not to, to misrepresent, right? As soon as you start introducing real things from that time. There's also a, um, a story in there, a scene that involves a Life magazine story about Annie Glenn. And it was page after page about Annie when John, after John Glenn had circled the earth. And um, that had been sent to me from a friend in Montana, Ann Hansen. And she had just said, she, thought she knew we were friends, Annie and I, and, and John, I mean, Sharon and I were friends with both Annie and John. And I thought, you know what, this would be perfect for a moment when Ellie's trying to talk about what it means to be a woman in America in 1962, 1963. I mean, so she has this issue on their coffee table because they adored the Glens. This is a 
adored the Kennedys. I mean, they had the Jack and Jesus all right, Jack Kennedy and Jesus, right. which I had growing up. <laughs> and so I had this scene where she gets to talk about Annie, and that is one of it, there are only two places where I'm really paying tribute. One is the nurses' aides list of my mom's, and one is that moment about Annie. And I Annie was quite sick when I figured out that I was going to do that, but I wrote her a long letter letting her know um, what this scene was going to be in the book. Um, because all of us had a feeling she would not be here by the time it came out. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted her to know what she had meant to me, what she had meant to so many, and that she really was a hero too. And, yeah. and so Ellie has this moment where she acknowledges that, that no one's calling Annie a hero, but think what she went through waiting on earth for John Glenn to come home. Right. And had to do it twice. Twice. Oh, she was, you know, I always laugh because she was so, so upset with him the second time he wanted to do it. <laughs> Because he was so much older in Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, that's yeah. That, what what a what a story that, that they have. Um, what a beautiful love story. Um, from Shayla, writes, You said that people are bigger and better than their worst mistakes. What do you think was your worst mistake? Oh goodness, oh, that list is so long. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what I would say to that question. You I'm know, sure it's not what, I have to say publicly. <laughs> well, well, there's that. First of all, that part <laughs> that's never coming out. But the other thing is, I one of the things I, I the benefit of living longer is that you can look back and see some of the things you thought were such enormous mistakes. Like for years, I thought it was a mistake that I let my mom, who was too worried about me leaving the state, talk me out of taking a copy editing job at the Indianapolis Star after I graduated. She's, well, you're not gonna leave the state, are you? Not uncommon in working class families. And I wondered how much that had held up my career. I don't give that a second glance now because look how my life turned out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I remember uh, it was before I started winning the bigger awards that I had a friend tell me, you, you stay in Cleveland. That was after I'd done a big series called Losing Lisa. Um, if you stay in Cleveland, you will never win the Pulitzer Prize. And I had to make a decision, because, and I had two different major newspapers looking at my work and wanting to interview me, but I thought I will lose this entire community I filled up with my daughter, who helps with my daughter. I didn't regret it, but some thought it was a big mistake at the time. I'm happy to report that it wasn't, but <laughs> even, if, even if I'd won nothing, I'm so proud of my daughter and my son and who they've turned out to be. So some things that feel like big mistakes end up not being down the road. It ends up being life, right? Yeah, it's life. That's right. What is, this is from Wendy Lee Ward. She says, what is your favorite writing instrument? Pen, pencil, brands? Um, I have it right here. I have boxes and boxes of these right now. I carry always on me the Pilot Razor Point Extra Fine in blue. Oh, and nice. It's, and I just bought a bunch because I knew I was going to be signing a lot of books and book plates. Uh, in fact, these are the pens that signed your books from Gramercy. This is the pen I wow. do. <laughs> and I've used it for years. It's my favorite pen, and I've probably used it for a decade now. And I just order it by the box, so I always have them. And Sherrod sometimes sneaks off of some of them, which is why I usually order multiple boxes when I get it. <laughs> She's generous, too, people. Um, Eric Kelsey <laughs> ha asks, what are you reading right now? Well, I just finished, uh, finished to blurb two books, David Giffel's Barnstorm, Barnstorming Ohio. I highly recommend it. That's coming out in August. And I just read uh, Chaston Buttigieg's, Buttigieg's, how, how could I have gotten that wrong? His memoir, which is coming out, I believe in September. I, I did a blurb for that one. And Columbus readers in particular will know Lee Martin, who is nationally known with a Pulitzer finalist for one of his novels. He's got a new memoir coming out that is okay. as gorgeous as you would come to expect of Lee Martin. And I'm going to be writing about that for him soon, but I'm about to finish it. And I love that. So I also read um, Eric Larson's re recently, um, I'm going to get this wrong again. What's it? The, uh, oh, that's not my dog. I'm just Sorry. happy to know that's not Walter <laughs> Franco. I should tell readers what I did. I put, we have two sleep machines here that we use for grandchildren, the babies, when they come to stay here. And sometimes we put them on in the evening so that the dogs maybe won't bark during the night, right? And it seems to be working just recently. So I actually have one going right now in the living room and it seems to be working. <laughs> they think they're supposed to be sleeping. We'll see how long it lasts. 
Let's see. Um, I This is from Peggy Miles. She says, I love that you maintain your positive attitude so well through your writing. Do you have specific daily activities that help you maintain that outlook? Now, this isn't just about writing. This is just about life, I guess. I walk and then I walk some more. <laughs> the more upset I am, the longer I walk. Although I have a friend who once said he ran out of walk before he ran out of worry. I've certainly known those <laughs> moments. Um, I have a wonderful network of people who are close to me, many of whom have known me for decades, mostly women, but not all. And of course I have Sherrod. And I say that Sherrod is, um, his default button is set to joy. He's had his challenges with that the last three and a half years, but he still is that guy. And, um, I guess one of the biggest things I've learned in recent years, I tend to be very independent, try to be very strong all the time. One of the signs of strength is to know when you need to reach out. And I've gotten much better at just, if nothing else, sending a text, hey, can you, you have a chance? Can we catch up? I just want to hear how it's going. Um, I also watch really ridiculous shows on television sometimes. I had never seen Gilmore Girls. Um, <laughs> I think part of it is the stubbornness because I was a single mom at the time and I, people kept saying, oh, you need to watch Gilmore Girls. It's just like you and your daughter. Thank God it wasn't. I hope I was a little more strict at times. But I watched <laughs> the entire series recently. And so I was at Stars Hollow for weeks on end and Jared said, this is a ridiculous show. And I said, and yet here you are again, sitting next to me watching it. <laughs> and so he liked it too because he liked Luke, the guy in the diner. So anybody who remembers Gilmore Girls will know what I'm talking about. So you got to have fun. You can't, it can't all be work. It can't be. I mean, we're we are so aware of what's happening every single day because of Sherrod's job and mine as a columnist. We have got to have outlets. And of course we have our dogs. I can't, Franklin and Walter saved me on many a day. Um, yeah, for me, it's been uh, cheers lately. There you go. <laughs> See? I, I love it. It's my, it's just goofy and that's my escape it's and it's fun. silly and yeah, yes. absolutely. Uh, share. Well, it's from Sharon. I can't pronounce the whole name. Um, asks, how long did you have Erie Town in your heart before you gave it birth? I, I can only answer that now, having written it, understanding that it was in me long before it came out as a novel. Um, I knew I was going to call it Erie. I mean, it was the working title was Erie Town itself for a long time. Oh, okay. um, my friend Sue Klein got me a sign had it made for me, Erie Town, established 1957, which is the year I was born in. She gave that to me, I think, five years ago. And seeing the visual of that somehow just really affected me and made me think, okay, this town exists now. These stories are in me, and I need to find a way to get these characters out because they're rattling the cage now, and I can hear them. And Sue is the one who also just, I just realized I have this here, this necklace now that is actually a miniature wooden cover of my book. Oh, I have neat. Really I have such wonderful friends, and Sue Klein is at the top of that list. Let me tell you, she is so supportive. How cool is that? Eventually, yeah. you'll have this, you'll have just, you know, <laughs> lot, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to be that way, you know, Connie Schultz, she's always wearing all her Erie Town stuff. That's a little weird. <laughs> all full of herself. I feel a little sorry for her. Never run another thing. It's all Erie Town, all the time. I'd like that to turn into that woman. Oh, here's a good question. Um... It's from one zoo lady. <laughs> it says, I started a, couple of started a couple of chapters, but I'm wondering how hard it was to write such a violent chapter about Patch the dog. Did you give Walter and Franklin extra hugs after? I did. I want to remind everybody who knows me. You know, if you know me, you know how I love dogs. I am never going to kill a dog. Um, Patch lives. I feel the yes, need to Patch let lives. Patch lives. A long life. Um, but I'm also aware of how First of all, I'm very aware of family violence, unfortunately. I know how it can have long-term effects on people, and especially children. And I wanted to illustrate, you know, this little boy was such a sensitive child, and he loved his dog. And so I wanted readers to understand early that this was part of the complexity of Rick uh, and part of what happened to him when he was young. But I am never going to murder a dog in my book. They will always <laughs> die of old age. Sorry, that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> Um, Marianne Kafer asks, could you have written this novel at 47? So you made the point that you hadn't, here you are writing your first novel at 62. Could you have done it at 47? If I weren't doing anything else, I certainly could have put the time into it. Would it have been the book it is now? Probably not. 
Um, I had, you know, you, you get, you, you become one of two things as you get older, you either become weaker or you become braver, right? In terms of you just had too much and you decided that's it, I'm giving up. Or you think there's been so much and here I am, I'm still standing. And what do I have to contribute now? So I'm not going to look back too much. I'm a, I mean, 47, I had just won some pretty big prizes in my profession. And I was really feeling I had my game going there on that. I love being a columnist. Um, and my daughter was still at home. I don't think I could have written a novel when my kids were younger. I have such admiration for particularly these uh, women who are novelists. And J. Courtney Sullivan, Mary Beth Keene, who, you know, they, all these other things going on in their lives. And they are still writing incredible fiction. I so admire them. I wasn't somebody also who longed to write fiction before. Now I do, I'm just constantly thinking about it and what I want to do next. But I wanted to, first of all, I was raised to make a living, right? If I was going to go to yeah. college, I had to have a job and I was going to make a living. I felt such, I've always felt the privilege of being a journalist and talking to strangers and how much they trust me. So I can't say I regret any of that. But no, I don't know that this book would have been the book it is now if I hadn't done it now. Elizabeth asks, would you promise to do another author's event post COVID-19 in Columbus? You are so beloved to those of us who love your wow. writing and how you share your family via social media. I would also love to see you featured as a superhero character in a graphic novel. How can we make <laughs> that happen? Wow, those are two really big things. All right, yeah. I can't speak to the superhero thing, but I would love, I would love to come back when we can all be together. I mean, I am so sorry we're not but I want all of you to be safe. This is why we're doing it this way. It's why all of us are doing it this way. Mm -hmm. I would love to come back and do an author's event. And I promise we'll figure out ways. If I'm invited, I will get there. I can sort of feel the energy of the crowd out there. There's a feeling, <laughs> I, I mean, and it's really great having these, the, the questions from the audience too. It's, uh, it is, I love that. Thank you so much. I could much see them all popping me. up while we were talking. And um, let's see, Angela asks, what can you tell us about how remote reporting has changed how journalists are reporting for better or worse. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge all the journalists who are not doing it remotely, who are putting themselves often at great risk to cover events, particularly um, they're covering the White House, they're covering the protests right now, they're covering so much out there that does put them at risk, including a president who keeps calling them the enemy of the people, which puts them at greater risk indeed. Um, we've always been journalists who could also pick up the phone um, I don't want journalists becoming uh, dependent on emails and getting email answers. To, yeah. I, I, I'm not a fan of that, never have been. Agreed. We will not always be in the age of coronavirus. I am concerned who will, be, who will remain as journalists at the end of it. It's a, every local newspaper has its critics, as it should. That's, that's what it means to be a regional journalist. But we've never needed them more in my lifetime because of so many things that need to be covered. And in terms of just... Look at how many are not wearing masks right now. I'm concerned just about that issue alone. If we, please, all of you, when you're out in public, I hope you're still wearing your masks. It's really important. This is how we stop the spread. And so if we have more journalists being able to give examples of why that matters and reporting on when it, when it doesn't happen, there's so much going on right now that we need them. I will never not be a journalist in my heart, no matter how many novels I write. I've been doing this for more than three decades and I do consider it a mission. It's so much more, and Anne, I'm sure you could speak to this as well. This has never been just a career. This right. has been a calling. Right, right, absolutely that. Um, uh, from Angela, what are the news stories we should be paying attention to but may have missed with the other major news going on? Um, I would be paying close attention to voter issues and voter protections. I think we, uh, I don't think it's a partisan issue to say that everyone should be voting and everyone should want people to vote, eligible voters to vote. So I'm concerned that that's getting lost in a little bit. Things are happening at warp speed, in part because um, this administration often wants to distract us from the bigger things that are happening. It's hard to ignore what's happening with COVID-19. We're seeing an increase in many states right now. So right. I do think it's important to pay attention to the serious reporting, to be looking to the to the public health experts who are guiding us on this. And uh, I would really encourage people to raise their voices more on social media and letters to the editor in their own essays and their op-eds they wanna write. That is about how we, how, what do we do as this national election is coming to a head? 
it's going to be a very ugly time for our country, unfortunately. And the number one goal all of us should have right now is getting as many people to vote as possible and being very outspoken about how we believe that everyone's right to cast that vote. And quite frankly, it, it's gotta be by mail. For it, We're gonna lose a lot of voters if we can't and we should be advocating for that in every state in the country. You know, I'm really glad that the Columbus Dispatch has, in my opinion, kind of expanded the letter writing section, letters to the editor mm -hmm. section. I think at the time has never been more important to have. To, I just, it's one of the first places I go to after my horoscope. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> Is the letters to the editor and just see what people are saying. What are they talking about? And um, it matters. It matters so much. Um, I agree. We only have time for about one more question. And uh, I'm going to go for it. It's from Angela. And she said, how is the current, current anti-racism movement influencing your work? Well, it's been part of my work for as long as I've been a journalist. And certainly in my 18 years as a columnist, we live in the city of Cleveland. We're a minority race in our zip code here. And, um, and that's by design. We want, first of all, I love Cleveland. Um, I feel very strongly about this. And I've been writing this and saying this on national television, writing it in my columns. As long as white Americans keep talking about this as a black problem or a black community issue, we are not owning this problem that is ours too. We're keeping um, our black brothers and sisters at arm's length. We're keeping a distance. We're being able to still tell ourselves this is their problem, this is their the other, when in fact, this is our problem. This is America's problem. I am so encouraged by the number of people who've been willing to speak out who didn't before, including in the administration. And I am particularly encouraged by the number of people. I just want them to be safe in the streets when they do it and wear their masks. But I, I'm feeling a turning point for our country. And it's been something that so many of us have been calling for and waiting for and fighting for for a very long time. And now I just want to see more voices, particularly of Black and Latina women. Um, I want to see them published more. I want to see them interviewed more. I want them getting more book deals. And I'm encouraged by some of the efforts I'm seeing both in journalism and the publishing field, not enough in academia yet, and a little I'm more than a little concerned there. But that's where my voice, I feel, can be the most important is in advocating for those. I, if my legacy, my only legacy is my job success, my career success, it dies with me. We must carry as we climb. And one of the things we can be doing right now is standing shoulder to shoulder with people who, who deserve to have the same rights we've been always taking for granted. Connie Schultz, it's just been a privilege and a delight, as I knew it would be, to talk with you tonight. Thank, Thank you, you so Anne. much. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. And I guess this is my cue now to throw it back to Linda Cass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Anne. I encourage all of you in the audience to tell your friends about the Daughters of Erie Town. For those who haven't yet had a chance to read Connie's novel, you could hear tonight that you are in for a treat. Thank you, Connie and Anne, for an incredible and illuminating discussion. In reading through the chat box, I know that your conversation brought some viewers <laughs> to tears. Thank oh. you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Linda. everyone. Now stay safe. And thanks to all of you viewers for joining us tonight and for your thought-provoking questions. Thank you to WOSU Public Media and Mills James Productions for your partnership. I wanna remind you of the links at the top of the chat box with registration to the June 23rd Gramercy Book Club featuring Julia Alvarez in Afterlife and the Ju July 9th conversation with Robert Kolker about his book, Hidden Valley Road. And there's also a link if you'd like to purchase another copy of Connie's novel for your parent, husband, wife, sibling, or friend. Thank you again for joining us at Gramercy Books and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>